As new ways to improve the university environment are discovered, how does a research university record the many nuanced decisions made to enhance student learning? In his 2003 book, Universities in the Marketplace, the Commercialization of Higher Education, former Harvard University President Derek Bach warns that profit-seeking can threaten the university's obligation to give the best possible education to its students. Yet warning is insufficient, as any member of the university community well knows. If universities are to be competitive in their own right to serve their students, Bach asks that universities determine how much their students have learned during the course of study. Satisfactory methods of outcomes assessment are in place for a number of areas of study, he notes, and proper use of such instruments can give faculty a clearer sense of how their students are progressing and where improvements might be made. It is the cumulative effort of many separate measures, he writes, that can change the balance of a university. In this podcast, we examine the possibility of a documentary approach to recording the cumulative varied measures that a research university such as NGIT uses to change the balance of education to improve student learning. I'm Norbert Elliott, chair of the NGIT Middle States Commission on Higher Education Self-Study, and I'm presenting this podcast. In previous podcasts, we reviewed the NGIT cycle of student learning. In this four-stage cyclical process, we identify the university's core goals as expressed in the NGIT mission and NGIT Strategic Plan 2010 through 2015. And we study the many ways that those goals are integrated into the university's programs. The cyclical model employs the NGIT program review process as a forum for curricular innovation and instruction as assessment as we seek to document our efforts to assemble proof that we're indeed paying careful attention to our university community. We've also described the NGIT matrix of student learning and assessment. In that process, we've described how we identify core goals of NGIT and we'll proceed over time to map those goals to a wide variety of NGIT programs. We also demonstrated how the College of Science and Liberal Arts, an early adopter of the cycle and matrix models, was able to identify core NGIT goals by tailoring them to the express goals of the college's offerings in support of the general university requirements, as well as undergraduate and graduate degrees offered within the college. We understood that, in an experimental sense, we had designed a robust and experimentally verifiable model of student learning and assessment. Yet a careful listener would note that while three phases of the cycle for student learning and assessment have survived the proof-of-concept test, the final phase remained untested. How do we document the improvements that we make as a result of our assessment efforts, or put another way? How does the gap analysis work when we find that we've done well yet have more work to do? The question is not at all trivial. Again, we turn to Derek Bach. Professors, he writes, are busy people, too preoccupied with their own classes, their own departments, their own research, to see the campus as a whole or appreciate its larger problems and opportunities. How can university governance take greater advantage of the best qualities of faculty and administration? Solving this problem, Bach writes, creatively and well represent the principal challenge to the modern university. In approaching this principal challenge in terms of recording changes made as a basis of observation, we believe that a key connection has been glossed over. The deep engagement with classes and departments and research, it's precisely that engagement that holds the potential to yield a more natural and richer system of recording change a documentary approach to gathering information. We believe that a documentary approach to gathering information can address this crucial challenge precisely because documentaries provide a very natural and rich system for recording change. Typically, we think of documentary in terms of genre, films such as Man on Wire, a 2009 Academy Award winner that captures Philippe Petit's successful wire walk, between the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in 1974. We think of books such as those written by Robert Coles in the Children of Crisis series that won the Pulitzer Prize a year before Petit's historic walk between the now-fallen towers. 
It is Coles who may be our best guide here. The very word documentary derives from the Latin word docere, to teach. As such, an effort to provide documentary evidence both teaches and records acts that are integral to the professorate. Here's Coles in his 1997 classic book, Doing Documentary Work. Documentary evidence substantiates what is otherwise an assertion or a hypothesis or a claim, he reminds us. Yet how do we know a documentary when we see it? With the physician poet William Carlos Williams, we respond, I got it, or even better, I'm really getting it. This is not, of course, to suggest that documenting a project of outcomes assessment that yielded curriculum improvement and student learning is easy. Any kind of documentary work, as research itself, is a continually developing record made in many ways with many voices. Taken together, these ways and voices constitute the response of a university in answer to that overwhelming question, is the institution fulfilling its mission and achieving its goals? What then are the preconditions that will lead a reviewer to say, I got it, or even better, I'm really getting it, at the end of a documentary effort undertaken in the service of student learning assessment? First, the documentary will provide information that substantiates knowledge of a community under examination and the efforts made to deepen the learning experience. Ratings of student skills by field experience supervisors, student portfolios, scores on locally developed or standardized embedded examinations all provide direct, clear, and compelling evidence of what students are learning. Second, the documentary will provide layers of information from perhaps the use of social media, such as this podcast, to a deeper explanation of the community under examination through organized hard copy collections of documents or online resources linked to further proof of engaged effort. Indeed, avant-garde assessment may be documented by conference presentations and peer-reviewed papers. Third, the documentary authors will articulate a level of confidence that they have in their processes and decisions. So, a locally developed assessment analyzed in relationship to a nationally normed test will yield valuable information that links a specific context to a larger population. On the other hand, ratings of student field experiences have a great sense of validity because students are viewed by those who have seen a wide variety of their abilities that extend far beyond what can be measured in a time test. A good documentary study will delineate the weaknesses and strengths of the effort, a process of self-refutation important, as Karl Popper famously observed, to all good research. Finally, a documentary response to record student learning assessment will demonstrate that the process used is not a one-shot case study, but rather part of a plan, useful, effective, and sustainable effort. Of course, those two are qualities of all good research. Further podcasts in this series will investigate whether the effort at documenting evidence of student learning through planned assessment processes is a viable phase in the NGIT cycle of student learning and assessment.